Hello, good old fashioned triple test for you today because this is the kind of thing we do. So if you like, subscribe, turn on notifications, you'll never miss one. Today it stars the all new Range Rover Evoque, a premium compact SUV and its two chief rivals. One is the Audi Q3, the other is the Volvo XC40, voted European Car of the Year last year by some jurors including yours truly. But let's see which is the best. And so what's new about the Evoque? Because it looks similar to the old version and bar a few millimetres here and there, it is pretty much the same size. Well, underneath it is a new PTA model platform architecture, not PITA, you should know, uh, which is pretty new and allows a longer wheelbase, more practicality on board, as well as a mixed metal construction and a whole family of 48 volt mild hybrid powertrains, including this one. Inside there is a completely revised interior and a new twin touchscreen system which made its debut on the Vela. Which means you get two touchscreens. Everything basically is controlled via touchscreen. There are very few real dials. There is one down here which does the heater and stuff, but this multifunction display, the clever thing about it, is that at once it can do the climate control, then it can do the seats, then it can do the vehicle drive modes, and then it has a broader settings menu. You have to take your eye quite a long way off the road to look at it, so the idea is that it's only for controls that you don't touch very often. Other controls, such as the radio and the navigation and the telephone, are on a top touch screen that is not such a stretch away for your eyes, at least that's the thinking. And then there are what is actually some quite funky steering wheel mounted controls, which can display different things. Now, I would still prefer a proper knobby dial thing, which is always where I left it, so that I can do that without having to take my eyes off the road and it scans around a screen and I only have to take my eyes off the road very rarely. But this touchscreen is a common theme to all three of these cars. Audi, which used to have the MMI system, which had uh, a rotary dial plus some buttons around it, has now gone completely touchscreen. It's relatively easy to navigate, but is not quite as straightforward as a rotary controller. And the Volvo has a big upright iPad-y style touchscreen that you can swipe through and swipe backwards and forwards. Again, it's quite big, it's quite easy to navigate around, but I wouldn't mind just having a button. Right, I've come to sit at the back of the Volvo because I happen to think it's probably the nicest rear cabin of the three. Not necessarily because it's the most spacious, although all three have got, I think, a reasonable amount of room. This is my driving position. I've got about hand's width of leg and headroom, though this has got a sunroof which eats into it a little bit, but it's quite spacious enough. And I'm five foot ten, so an adult behind an adult is fine. But this is the only one that gets quite cool chromed vents in the back. It feels like there's the most space across it, but significantly, it's also the one I think with the lowest window line. The Evoque is, ha, has the highest, and that's important because if you've got kids in the back with a high window line, it can feel quite claustrophobic. The Volvo, as you might expect, feels quite airy. Well, let's talk about a peculiar engineering phrase called perceived quality, because when people build cars and they talk about quality, they don't mean quality like you or I necessarily understand it. What they mean is quality is this being able to do the same thing time and time again to a standard. What we perceive as quality, hence perceived quality, is how nice things are. And all three of these cars do something quite differently. They all want to convince you they're a premium car, but they go about it in different ways. So the Audi's got quite, a, quite an aggressive looking interior in a way, with sharp angles, uh, sort of brushed aluminium surfaces, but the material quality as I would know it, is, is pretty good. You know, there are soft touch plastics in most places, but it does start to fall apart a little bit as you get lower down in the cabin. Most of the places you touch often are of decent soft feel. If you move into the Volvo, it's a slightly different thing. They, rather than the aggression, they've gone for a slightly more Scandi cool, slightly more airy feel to it. Uh, these panels here, by the way, you don't have to have this bright orange Alcantara, I must say. But the, the Volvo has a strip around here that you can select different kind of feels to, which is pretty, which is pretty cool. It's just a lighter, it's an area, it's a more relaxed environment, but still feels quite plush, I think. The Range Rover goes for the full on plusher armor. Every material is soft. Every material is trying to make you ensconced within the cabin. Now, if I do have a problem with the Range Rover, it's that it's got this pretty attractive looking sort of chromed satiny bit around the gear lever. But when the sun shines on it, it then glares up blindingly in the face. So there are slight ergonomic issues with the Range Rover, but for what it's worth, I think it's the one that does perceived quality the best.
All right, because this is a proper like buyer's guide, group test and everything, let's talk boot space. I have looked up the volumes for each of these cars and I'm not really sure I believe it. Some manufacturers measure them in slightly different ways to others. But in short, the seats go down in all of them. The Evoque has a reasonably high load lip and look, this is how you get measurement. It's about that wide, okay? What is interesting, it's not that long inside. It does have a cubby underneath the boot floor though, because there is no spare. If you spec a spare, you don't get it. It's reasonably well finished inside and there's a little alcove each side. So if you are taking golf clubs or something, then they fit in there. And so to the Audi, which has, I can tell you straight away, a much wider boot opening. So if you get larger things in, it'll fit more easily in the Audi. The, the figures suggest that the Evoque has the biggest boot. I don't believe it. I think the Audi's is bigger. It is longer, it is wider, and there is an underfloor storage thing, and the boot floor itself has two levels, so it drips lower as well. It also has a similar boot height to the Range Rover and the Volvo, which is about the same sort of height again, but there is no question it is the narrowest of all three openings. I think it's probably the narrowest boot. It's maybe the narrowest car, but what I quite like is that it has this thing in the back. You can load it like that, and it has three bag hooks on it. So it's quite a versatile, quite a funky, useful space, if not quite as voluminous as the other two. And so to the driving, what have we got? Well, all of these cars are two litre turbo diesels. They're all monocoques, steel monocoques, largely. The Evoque platform is new to the extent that it is allowed to have very mild hybrid system, like really mild hybrid system. So the start stop stops the engine as you're coasting up to a junction, stops going really quickly. It's basically a starter alternator that just fills a little bit of turbo lag at low revs. It never drives on electric power uh, alone, but what it does do is just helps the CO2 and fuel economy match some of the other two cars here. It's 178 brake horsepower, 180 PS, so it's a little bit down on the other two cars which have 10 horsepower more. The diesel engine in this one drives through a nine-speed automatic gearbox, two or four wheeled. Now, I've never hitherto been really impressed with the Jaguar two-litre diesel, Ingenium, I think they call it, engine with its quietness, but in here, it's really quiet in it, really impressively quiet. Slightly less impressive is the gearbox and the way it hunts around for ratios at lower revs. When you're pulling away particularly, it's a little bit lethargic, a little bit sluggish. That might be a result of trying to make sure the engine goes through the emissions cycle and everything else. Its response is quite slow, so you don't end up with unburned things coming out the back. That's just you know the nature of some modern diesels. But that aside, it's a very refined, very grown-up powertrain. And the rest of the ride is very refined and grown up too. That's one thing that Jaguar the Land Rover does typically very well, is the ride and handling of its cars. The ride on this car is good. The steering is smooth and precise and the responses are measured. It's not overtly hyperactive, it's not overtly agile. What it does have is it has a cushioned, sophisticated ride quality with low noise levels. It feels you know, like a, ba like a baby Range Rover. That's how it's meant to feel, that's what it does well. And to be fair, the rest of the interior cabin ambience does match that, you know, the materials are good, the driving position is good. It, it's that sort of accomplished, well-finished, well-rounded product. And it's on the money of the other two, it's about 40,000 40, quid in this specification, this is S specification. The specifications get quite complex and blah, 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 but if you go through and you do the mathematics, then this is, you know, a competitive car. Inside the XC40 then, it's more road noise, isn't there? It's better on that surface, but on a slightly broken surface, you get a bit more road roar, and the engine is noisier. The Volvo has the loudest engine of the trio, there's absolutely no question about that, but it also mates that with possibly the most responsive gearbox. It slushes through its changes very quickly. Step off from rest is much quicker than in the Evoque. I like this car very much. A, it's funky and airy and spacious inside, and Volvo hasn't made it try and feel like a hatchback or a saloon car. It's given space to breathe, space to roll, 
the space to behave like a relaxed SUV, but the Range Rover does that better. So there is some comfort here. It's quite pleasant in a straight line. It steers really nicely, actually. It steers and self-centers quite nicely, and it responds to its steering quite well. But the Range Rover feels more sophisticated all round. It is certainly quieter. And apart from the initial throttle response where this is superior, uh, I think the Range Rover does probably everything else a bit better, although this steers quite nicely too. And I didn't necessarily expect that because I've had quite a lot of time for this car. And finally then into the Audi, which I don't know if you can hear, makes more noise, not as much as the Volvo, the engine, but it does make more noise than the one in the Land Rover. This interior does not feel as plush as either of the other two. It doesn't have the kind of laid back cool of the Volvo and it doesn't have the outright refinement and luxurious feel. I don't think of the Range Rover either. There's a bit of road noise too. I think Audi has tried to make the Q3 feel the most dynamically agile car in this class. To an extent it does, it has fairly quick steering and a reasonably responsive engine. Arguably the most agile in that respect, but the ride is the firmest. And you're looking at a tall car, if you want an agile car, here's a tip, don't buy an SUV. The steering doesn't take on any extra weight or anything as you steer, it's just a while I say it's a bit more agile than the others. I think genuinely it is the least pleasant to drive. So overwhelming is a word, and underwhelming is a word. The word whelming does not exist. There is no middle ground. You cannot just be whelmed. But if you were able to be whelmed, this would be a whelming car. Actually, it might even be underwhelming. It just feels the least luxurious, the least welcoming, it's not that nice a car, is the truth of it. It's just not good enough. This just is not good enough. The Volvo is better. The Range Rover is the best. So there you have it. SUV company makes best SUV. Shouldn't necessarily be a surprise, should it? But I was slightly surprised by how much better the Evoque is than the competition. So if you like this triple test, remember we're here all the time. Don't forget to like, subscribe. If you turn on notifications, we'll never miss one. Thank you very much for watching. We really, really very much do appreciate it. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.